up for their message this morning. Children of any age, or, come on. Jake, I am so glad that you are up here because I was feeling all alone being the only boy. <laughs> so thank you for joining me. Today in the life of the church is called, and this is a big word, Transfiguration Sunday. Can you say that word? Transfiguration. Basically it means that Jesus just became so bright that it was almost too much for the disciples who were looking at him uh, to watch. And so they had to, to cover their eyes. They fell down to the ground. Listen to this story. This is from Mark's Gospel, chapter 9. And then Miss Teresa is going to tell you a little more about it. Six days later, Jesus <laughs> took with him Peter and James and John, and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. They were afraid at what they were seeing. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the Beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when Peter, James, and John looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, only Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, Miss Teresa. Good morning. Oh. You guys happy to be out on this cold day? Uh, yeah, it's me too. Um, what we're going to talk about a little bit today is listening. Do you guys listen well? You promise? All right, we're going to do a little experiment. We're going to see how well our church family knows Pastor Mike. You got this, Michelle? Okay. They are going to, on the count of three, give us an answer. And we're going to listen and see if we can hear what they're saying, okay? On the count of three, they're going to tell us what pastor's my, Pastor Mike's favorite color is. What? Favorite what? Color. Oh, color. Oh. Okay. On the count of three, Miss Joan. <laughs> One, two, three. Did you hear that? What do you think it was? You weren't listening, were you? You heard three colors? Red, green, and blue. All right, don't tell them. All right, we're going to try it again. We're going to give them a different question and see if they can get this one right. All right, you guys have to really listen. Got it? Okay, on the count of three, they're going to tell us what his favorite kind of food is. You ready? All right. One, two, three. Ice cream. <laughs> Mexican ice cream and Italian. Green, green food. Free food. <laughs> okay. I'm, right. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a Methodist preacher. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm surprised you didn't say potluck. Okay. Jacob, what did you hear? Oh, 
chocolate Mexican and ice cream. Okay, you guys aren't listening. Are you really listening? Okay, we're going to try an experiment. We're going to turn all of our electronics off. Okay? You got all, our, all of your electronics off? Okay, are you really paying attention? Okay, look out there and make eye contact because when you're looking, we know you're listening. Okay? Now, got it? Close your eyes. Really listen, and now they're going to tell you on the count of three what they think the best way for Pastor Mike to talk to God is. Got your eyes closed? Okay. One, two, three. Right. You hear that one? What was that? So you were listening that time, right? Is that right? Okay, so what's your favorite color? I don't have one. He doesn't have one. Okay, failed experiment. Okay, what's your favorite food? All of it. All of it. Okay, we didn't get that one right either, did we? Okay, so what I want you to get from this is when we really listen and we pay attention, Peter was really listening on the mountain, wasn't he? Was Peter really listening? Did he hear the voice of God? He did? Was he really paying attention? Okay. So your work for this week, your homework, remember we always have homework at church, right? It's not extra practice. It's homework. You have to listen. Olivia. Oh, okay. Good stuff. All right. So we're going to pray. We're going to listen. And that's your homework this week. All right. Ready? Gracious God, we're so thankful for this opportunity to come together and help us remember to listen and listen well this week. Let us look for you. Let us feel for you. Let us know in our heart that you're here for us and that we're going to listen. And these things we ask. Teresa's asked you some questions. Do you remember last week's question? Anybody remember last week's questions? Been a lot of cold weather between then and now. Last week's question, anybody remember last week? Janet, what do you mean? No. Um, last week's question was what, what motivates you? Why do you do what you do? got another question. Why do you come to worship? I'm full of questions. Why do you come to worship? I want to use the story of the Transfiguration to offer some possible responses to that question. I think we come to worship to be together. Jesus could have gone up on the mountain by himself, but he didn't. He took Peter, James, and John. They went up on the mountain together. We are a together people. It's the way we were made. Uh, the word for church, ecclesia in Greek, we get the word ecclesiastical from it. It literally, literally means to assemble, to come together. We know that while we spend time by ourselves alone, and that's important, we know that our life is incomplete alone. We wouldn't have made it this far if it hadn't been for other people, if it hadn't been together. I stood in line at the funeral home on Friday behind Janet Romano. We, we talked, waiting to greet Carrie Crawford, whose sister died suddenly. There was a long line in front of us, behind us, 
When someone dies and we grieve, that's evidence of the fact that deep inside of us, we are connected. We are relational people. We wouldn't hurt so much when someone dies if we weren't. That's evidence. And we wouldn't care so much about each other's hurt and grief in their loss if we weren't interconnected. Connected. One of the reasons why we come to worship together is because this is a, a basic human need. God made us in God's own image, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Our God is a communion. And so are we. So we worship. We come to worship to be together. Up on the mountaintop, two persons from the past appeared and talked with Jesus. One was Moses. Another reason why we come to worship, I believe, is because we yearn for our lives to matter, to make a difference. We yearn for, for us to spend what time we have on this earth not wasting that time, but being used by God for something that is lasting, enduring, something that is eternal. We come as a result and look into the mirror of those who have gone before us whom God has used for God's purposes. We look into their mirror to see our own lives mirror so that we, we gain a little hope that, golly, if God can use a Moses, God can use a Mike. You know Moses' story. If you know Jesus' story, if there's one other person in the Bible, in our faith, faith story, whose story you probably would do well to learn, it would be Moses. In fact, in the New Testament, Jesus is compared, especially in Matthew's gospel, to Moses. He was saved from infanticide by the horrible dictator Pharaoh. You remember the little reed basket and how Pharaoh's daughter found him in the water and took him and they raised him. He was raised with a silver spoon in his mouth. He was raised not as um, an Israelite. He was raised as an Egyptian he grew up and you know what he did? He killed a man. He was a murderer. He took off, sought refuge, became a shepherd. Easy life. Thought he had it made. No conflict in his life. All he had to do was take care of the sheep. And then one day that burning bush spoke to him and out of that bush came, Moses, you're the one I'm sending to set my people free down in Egypt. You're going to go to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And what did Moses do? Immediately, Moses began to go down the list of why this was a bad idea, how God had it wrong. God, how can I go and speak to Pharaoh when I've got a speech impediment? I can't even speak, I can't speak to the powerless, the helpless, the weak. And here you're wanting me to go up and speak to Pharaoh? So he goes to Pharaoh with nothing more than a shepherd's staff and some plagues. And before you know it, Pharaoh is having enough of these people and he's sending them out. And Moses leads this people through the Red Sea. Remember how it divided? And they're wandering in the wilderness because it's taking time for the people to learn how to listen to God rather than Pharaoh, to learn that they're not slaves, they weren't created for that purpose, God had other things in mind. And these people, what did they do? It's interesting, the Bible said they murmured, they grumbled, they complained, they griped. They were, nothing would satisfy them. God gave them every morning, manna on the, on the ground like dew, bread to nourish them, and that wasn't enough for them. 
They kept telling Moses, take us back. At least back in Egypt, we had a more varied menu. All we have is manna. Moses had to break the news to him. Trust me, I'm following this pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. And they looked at him like he was crazy. One day he goes up on the mountain, remember? His own mountaintop experience. And there God speaks to him, gives him commandments to help the people know how to relate to God and to each other. He comes down off the mountain, his face, he's been so close to God that his face is like Jesus is kind of transfigured, bright. People couldn't look at him because he had been so present with God. His face shone, he came down, what did he find? He found this golden calf the people had made already just a short time being apart from them. They had drifted back to their old ways back in Egypt, worshiping a thing. He was so upset, so mad, he threw the tablets down, broke them, shattered them, had to go back up, get another set, came back down, ground that golden calf up in the powder, made the people drink it, made them sick. And then after all of that, that he had been through with God and been through with the people, he didn't get to accompany the people into the promised land. He didn't get to go back home with them. All he could do was look over and see it before he died. Moses' life was really complicated. <coughs> there was so much that went into it. And we come to worship to look into the mirror of lives like ours because yours and mine, to varying degrees, are just as complicated, just as messy. And our yearning is that this God who can take this murderer, Moses, can take whatever our failures are, whatever our moral weaknesses are, whatever albatross we're carrying around our neck, whatever is shackled around our ankle that we're dragging through life and free us to be useful for what God wants done through us. We come to hear our name call, if not from a burning bush, maybe from an anthem, or maybe from a scripture reading, or maybe even from a sermon, through a sermon. We come because, like Elijah, sometimes we get lost and we believe that if we come to worship, God will have, God will have an easier time finding us when we get lost. God won't have to look as far or look as hard because we, he'll know where to find us. Elijah had had this wonderful victory. You remember the contest of the, of the altars? The Baal priests, prophets, would build their altar, put wood on it, put a sacrifice on it, pray to Baal for fire to ignite it. Uh, Elijah would do the same, and this would kind of be a test to see whose God was the true God. 400, I think, Baal priests built their altar, prayed to their God, nothing. They cut themselves, they shouted, they danced, they did everything they could to get their God's attention. Nothing. Elijah taunted them. Well, maybe, maybe your God is asleep. Or maybe your God's on vacation. Finally, it came time for Elijah. And Elijah said, um, well, before I pray, uh, would you get some buckets of water and drench mine? Put some Put some water on mine. We don't want this to be too easy. Uh, put some more water on mine. Elijah was a bit of a showman, I think. And then he prayed, and what happened? Poof. His altar caught fire. And talk about the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. All 400 Baal priests were killed.
King Ahab and Queen Jezebel had had all of Elijah they could take. And they said, okay, we're going to do to Elijah what he did to our priest. And they sent their armies after them. And something happened to Elijah after, after God had ignited his altar and he had won that contest and his God had proven to be the God of all gods. He became afraid and that fear became depression and he took off to the desert to hide feeling that he was the only man of God left and soon there wouldn't even be him. God found Elijah and said, Elijah, what are you doing? Where are you going? Where are you? Why are you doing this? He said, go outside the cave you're hiding in. And Elijah did. And remember, there was the wind, the mighty wind, where God often could be found. But God wasn't in the wind. And then there was an earthquake where God often could be found, but God wasn't in the earthquake. And then there was fire where God often could be found, but God wasn't in fire. And then there was, and it, it depends on how you translate it. It can be translated sheer silence, or it can be translated still small voice. But Elijah heard something, sensed something, felt something, and he knew that God was with him. There was God. Some of us come to worship because of what life has been doing to us. We wonder where God is. Has God abandoned us? How could this be happening to me? Doesn't God care anymore? And so we come to worship to hear that still small voice or feel God's presence so that that blessed assurance that he has the whole world in his hands, even me. You know, I've become aware of that still small voice this way. There have been over my ministry people who have come up to me after a sermon and they'll say, it's like you were reading my mind, what you said this morning. It's like you had been following me around my life in my shoes all week. What you said meant so much to me. And I'll say, well, what was it I said that meant so much to you? And they'll tell me. And I know. I didn't say what they heard. God spoke to them through what I didn't say. We come to worship to hear a word from God and who can explain how it will come. Jesus took the disciples up. There was Moses, there was Elijah, and then there was Jesus, and he was transfigured among them. Transfigured. Something happened, and it was inexplicable. I believe underneath all the reasons why we come to worship. We come because we know that life is full of awe and wonder. We know that what is real can't be fully understood or comprehended or explained or managed or controlled. It's bigger than us. And we come, whether we're conscious of it or not, to acknowledge that together. <coughs> we come to affirm that there's more to life than what the world often acknowledges. And that the boxes that we try to put life in and put God in simply don't work, at least not all the time. And we know that to be the truth. And we come to be 
with people whom we trust know that to be the truth so that we can tell our stories like Judy Lee did a while back of that visitation in that hospital room where her husband was dying. She could tell us that story and we could nod our heads and say yes. It may or may not have happened to me that way, but I can affirm that God came to you that way. Some of us have said if we could only come to worship and through a sermon or through the music or through something, have that experience of, of God, of the living Christ, then my faith would never waver again. Well, then we would be very unlike Peter, James, and John because they had that experience of Jesus transfigured on the mountain. And when it came down to it, as the cross got near, they bailed out. As important as that experience we wish we could have, or maybe have had, is there's more to our faithfulness than just that mountaintop experience, or wherever it may happen. It may happen in the valley for us rather than the mountaintop. In fact, we come here to be reminded to be on our toes and to be alert because who knows when and where and how God's going to come to us and speak to us or touch us or make us aware of God's presence. I believe that the transfiguration was not just for the disciples. I believe the transfiguration was for Jesus as he heads to Jerusalem and the cross. That voice from heaven, this is my son. Listen to him. And Jesus received that assurance that God would be with him. And that assurance sustained Jesus even through the experience on the cross of God's a feeling, God per se. At some level, as he gave voice to my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus knew the Father was present. And it's that assurance of the Father's presence, I believe, that brings us together for worship. <clears throat>